For the first time for a live stream, uh, the eyes of Texas are here at the Voice of College Football and also the ears and, of course, uh, most uh, importantly, the mouths of Texas. We've got here to talk Texas football for the next hour here at the Voice of College Football. So please join us uh, by leaving your comments, your questions, your debate topics, your trash talk, whatever you want, as long as it's respectful in the uh, live chat. And I will uh, be reviewing those to serve them up to our Texas experts. Uh, gentlemen, we've got... Uh, Nick Battle from uh, Nino's Corner. We also have Steve Helwick, who has joined us uh, for a number of years on a regular basis to talk Texas football. You can join him on SB Nation. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm great, man. So let's get started with uh, spring practice because, of course, uh, this is much anticipated every year for every team. But when you've got a brand new head coach at this kind of marquee program and a whole new coaching staff, Steve, we'll start with you just in regards to it's so difficult to get information out of spring practice and we don't get uh, much video out of uh, spring practice and have to watch for the spring game, which doesn't tell us a whole lot, but it's nice to see the guys running out onto the field and getting a few things done. But in regards to what you can gather from spring practice, what is going to be some of those indications that this team is on the right track for you? I think a lot of it has to do with development of some of the younger players just, just because Texas is having a lot of turnover, important players this year leaving the program and Samuel Cosme and Joseph Asai, who are, they were the backbone of the offense and the defense in the previous year and losing a four year starting quarterback in Sam Ellinger. So this really feels like a transition season. I think they made some promising coaching hires based on what we saw out of quiet Kowski's defense in Washington and what we saw Steve Sarkeesian do in a redemption opportunity at Alabama last year. So I think just having the right guys step into those place into those positions of those departed players like Ellinger and Cosme and Asai and having them develop, I think that's going to be the biggest thing that can make Texas uh, continue winning and not go back to those five and seven seasons that we were, we were seeing a few years ago. Yeah. Your thoughts about that, Nick. Yeah, man. You know, so also I am, I am very, you know, like just, just like locked in to see what's going to happen on just like the whole defensive line right now, you know, so coach K is, is, is known for having two big uglies up there in the trenches. So it's going to be interesting to see who those two guys are going to be, you know, you know, you know, should it be sweat and Coburn should it be, you know, Coburn and uh, Collins. He has a bunch to play with there. And that's actually like one of our strengths this year, which has been something that we haven't been able to say for like the past six years or so. Want to let uh, everyone in the live chat know that uh, you can get a Texas uh, mask. So we've got those available for free at uh, voiceofcollegefootball.com. I will put the uh, banner up here pretty soon, voiceofcollegefootball.com. Just register for free. We'll get you a mask and also 20% off your first purchase. All right, guys, I will let you have at it in regards to what you want to see out of this coaching staff. Of course, you got a quarterback battle that is front and center it seems like Sam Ellinger's had the job for about 12 years. And uh, just in regards to this football team, this this is an intriguing situation. For anybody who loves college football, and especially the marquee brands, this is about as fascinating as it gets because you've got this blue blood program who's been underachieving. Um, I've discussed many times with Steve, uh, I thought Tom Herman was the right guy for the job. I thought he was a good hire. I thought he did decent work there, but didn't meet the expectations of most. Uh, that's a debatable point, but for, for most Texas people in college football nation did not meet the expectations. Uh, you've got an all-time great player in Sam Ellinger moving on. You got this Steve Sarkeesian who I would argue didn't get this job based on his performance at USC or Washington. Actually his, predecessors and successors both performed better at those two schools than he did, but he's got the Nick Saban touch running that prolific offense there at Alabama and all that he learned, hopefully from his first two stops. And again, just the Texas power, the brand, the facilities, the recruiting, can it all come together and work under Sark, uh, Steve? It, it should be fascinating. Yes, especially with Sarkeesian. You've seen him explain his offense at clinics too uh, before. So I think it's going to be installing a new type of offensive system at Texas, which Texas fans have longed 
for for a long time. I mean, how many Texas tweets have you seen about stop running wide receiver screens every single play and all those predictable things? So uh, I think they'll be able to go a little more vertical with Texas. We'll probably delve into the QB discussion later, but when I'm talking about vertical passing, I was really impressed what I saw with Casey Thompson in the oh, album yeah. because yeah. – I thought Sam Ellinger was a great quarterback, but I never really thought he had that vertical layer to his game that Casey Thompson has. And I think Thompson's going to be the guy when they play Louisiana, at least on week one, similar to how they started Bouchelle over a true freshman Ellinger a few years ago against Maryland. But I think that revolutionizing this offense under uh, Steve Sarkeesian, and he brought in Kyle Flood, a former Rutgers coach. So that that's one thing I'm really looking forward to seeing this season is just running better different types of plays seeing like what Alabama the concepts they ran against Ohio State last year in the national championship yeah you know so definitely man you know so Steve I am you know just looking forward to see you know Coach Hart's mantra right the all gas no breaks there have been too many times over the past seven years where Texas would have a lead and we would just ease up off the gas and that should be something that never happens here in Texas with the amount of talent that we have here. Right. So, you know, this all this what this all gas, no breaks mantra. This is something that has to come, you know, to Texas right now because we can get leads here and we need to keep pushing on the pedal and make these guys tap out. And that's something that Texas really hasn't done, you know, honestly, guys, in like seven years. So we got to get that back. We got the talent here on, you know, um, um, on campus. We got the wide receivers. We got B. John Robinson, who's definitely, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say it, a top five, you know, back in the country, you know, and possibly the best back here in the conference. So we got the offensive skill talent. It's just a matter of having the coach that can get the guys in the right spot and get them, you know, just to put points on the board and to keep wanting to put points on the board and never slow down. You mentioned Bijan. That's one thing I think is going to be interesting this year is ever since Deontay Foreman left, it feels like Texas has had a running back by committee with oh. nobody coming up and taking the job. I mean, we saw Keontae Ingram, I don't know, Daniel, Rojo, Young. Daniel Young. Yeah. Young. Johnson would <laughs> be a good secondary back this year, maybe yeah. in short yardage situations. But I'm excited for Texas to actually have a running back that feels like a star running back, like a Brees Hall type that could really contribute on offense. You see what some of these other programs of the conference has. Oklahoma's had them over the last few years, Joe Mixon. Every year. Every year. All at Iowa (laughs) State. And now Texas finally seems to have their guy, Bijan Robinson, severely underplayed last year, averaged over eight yards per carry. And he just seemed – he dominated the Alamo Bowl. He dominated pretty much every single time he touched the ball. And he's going to be one of those Heisman dark horses going into Hey, he's going to be a monster, man. So what Tom Herman did last year was so similar to what Mac Brown did with Cedric Benson's, you know, his uh, his first year. He didn't play Cedric Benson until after that OU game, right? And so everybody wanted to see said play, and he didn't play him. And once he did finally play him, Cedric Benson got a thousand yards that season. And it's one of those seasons that's like what you know, like what actually could have been for that season if said would have played the whole season, right? And the same thing last year, if Bijan would have played from game one and started, you know, Tom Herman might still be coaching here. You know, like he is that kind of talent to where, you know, anytime he gets the ball, like you say, Steve, it's like eight yards to carry. You know, it's like, it's he's just magical with the ball in his hands, man. So I am so pumped up just to see what he's going to do this year also. I saw one of the comments on the bottom line uh, just say Louisiana is going to beat Texas week one. That's that's an interesting thing because I don't think when Texas scheduled that game, they understood what a juggernaut Billy Napier would have like in this program. This is a better game than Arkansas. Uh, Hey, Arkansas. Arkansas held every team that they played last year. Uh, to their scoring average or less minus Alabama. So just think about that for a minute. That's how good that defense was last year. That coach has it humming down there. Arkansas is not a pushover anymore. They're going to be something serious for Texas. We got to come like just ready to play and pound the rock if we can against that defense. That's a stout defense. And there's a reason why Sark wanted, you know, Odom to be like the DC here because he knows what that defense is like even though he blew him out, was it 63 to something last year, but he knows what that defense is like. And he knows that if he gets that guy here at Texas with the Texas talent, you know, great things can happen, you know, but luckily, you know, you know, and, and you guys State. know that <laughs> nothing, you guys know that nothing's going to get the ire of this fan base up more than a loss to Louisiana oh, in week one. Okay. New early. coach Louis, because most <laughs> fans aren't going to have the perspective of Steve to say, Oh, Louisiana is really good. They, You're they beat, uh, 
Go, yeah, you yeah. know, they're going to be like, who are they? They're, they're nobody. We're Texas. How in the world did we lose this game? That that's going to really, they're well coached. I mean, they are a well coached team. Uh, you know, they're just a really good team and they're going to shock a lot of people next year. It just, hopefully they don't shock Texas. All right. Levi Lewis is returning. They, they've always had a lot of good running backs, just a lot of running back depth. They have Zion Hill back there, star defensive tackle. Louisiana is going to be a tough game on week one, and this will probably be a top four opponent, I'd say, on their schedule next year. So it's a, it's, I'm not saying Texas is going to lose this game, but it's not going to be an easy game. And we saw what Tom Herman entered his tenure with against a Maryland team that Texas was, I think, 17 and a half was the spread yeah. for it. Texas was ranked 23 for some reason coming off a five and seven season. And they just got punched in the gut 51 to 41 in all three phases of the game, really. So I thought that Texas really has to have a better start under Sarkeesian. I think for him to win over the fan base with these new coordinators and new quarterback, and it's going to be a difficult start, but I think I'm looking forward to the challenge Texas will have to face then. Yeah, man, most definitely, most definitely. For um, serious college football fans that um, root for other fan bases, we've got all sorts of fan bases represented in here that may know, okay, Ellinger, Ellinger, excuse me, has moved on. Uh, Bijan Robinson has, uh, he's on the cusp of becoming a star. Maybe some some other guys that might be a little bit um, under the radar that uh, could really break out this year, Nick. Yeah. All right. Some guys that, you know, I think, you know, should actually get some love here. It's going to be Troy Amiri. Troy Amiri could have, you know, you know, obviously been the best wide receiver on this team last year if he wouldn't have got hurt. He was a true freshman last year. This kid's huge, man. He's like 6'3", 230 pounds, very physical wide receiver. But he's one of those guys that can stretch the field. He has some wiggle in him, too, man. He's going to be a good one here, you know, hopefully this year. How about you, Steve? I am becoming a big fan of Alfred Collins in the same way Joseph Asaya press impressed me in the 2018 sugar bowl against Georgia. Alfred Collins felt like he had that breakout game against Colorado. He had the interception really good at stuffing the run defense there. So I think he's going to be a big piece And this defensive line has a lot of size on it with Keandre Coburn. And even in the second, uh, the backups of the defensive line there's just so much size that texas has there so i think that alfred collins can be a really key cog in the middle maybe reminiscent of what we saw in recent years with puna ford yeah definitely definitely you know what though steve i actually like alfred collins playing the end position you know Mm -hmm. um and him you know like you know like playing end and then having you know sweat and actually coburn in the middle and you got those two big guys you know 330 and What's what's sweat like 340 pounds, you know, just clogging up. I mean, you know, just clogging up the holes, man. And then just having, you know, you know, you know, like Collins, you know, just be that guy just that's like off the edge. So it's going to be very interesting, man. Very interesting. Another Oops. name I'm thinking of is Moro Ojomo, who's a really yeah. interesting person to me because he came into the program at age 17 from Nigeria and he never really played until last year. And they put him in some of those later games. I think it was. Iowa State maybe later in the year against Kansas State. He had a couple sacks, and he looked good in some of his reps. So he's another name I'm thinking with. Joseph Asai gone from that jack position. Is it him or Jacoby Jones that really steps up there and takes that pass rushing role for Texas? Definitely. And also, look at the cornerbacks, too. There's going to be some good cornerback battles there. You know, so Texas just got uh, done. You know, so Dunn actually came in, I think, from – where's it, Steve? That was McNeese was State, right? School. Yeah, yeah, you know, so he was a uh, good player, man, 6'1", about 100, and I think like, you know, like 6'1", maybe like 100, I think in like 85 pounds or so like that, but a good physical, physical cornerback, man, and he's one of those guys that Terry Joseph loves because Terry Joseph likes those physical backs that are going to come up to the line of scrimmage, hit you, they're going to get a bunch of tackles for loss, they're going to get a bunch of sacks also for guys that that are, you know, like, that are like actually safeties and cornerbacks. So it's going to be interesting to see Dunn actually, you know, like hopefully go for that starting role also. All right, let's lock it down to this quarterback battle that uh, people are interested in. Uh, I'm going to extend on uh, Steve's point that he made about uh, downfield throwing in the Alamo Bowl. Uh, Nick and I talked about this the other day because I saw Casey Thompson make some throws that uh, you don't see like many times on Saturday. Like just in in a small sample size, and I thought I want to see that again. I want to see that again, and he he did it about three times. I can think of two specific throws 
one that he was trapped in the pocket and he danced around a little bit, but he stayed in the pocket. Then he just, he just didn't have his body in the right position and just threw a laser in a tight window on the other side of the field. Yeah. It was a great throw. That's past and K Brewer. Yeah. Then he made another throw for a touchdown where he threw, I think it was a slant and he just threaded the needle again and just zipped it in there for a touchdown. And uh, I was just extremely, again, small sample size, but um, he sold me at least on on that um, second half of play. I was really impressed by some of his mobility in the pocket, especially because there were some times where there were some unblocked Colorado defenders coming at him, and he was just dodging them and still having the composure to get off a throw downfield and I, I really like all the tools he has in his game. I know we have not seen too many s- sample size of him. I think we saw him play against Rice in 2019. And the Alamo Bulls really is main data point we've had. And right now I would have him as a starter. I don't watch him in camp every day, see what the coaches see. But, I I mean, he has more experience with the program than Hudson Card. It's mm-hmm. just do you think that the program's going to have one of those Sam Ellinger things with Shane Bouchel, because it always felt inevitable that they Herman's guy, that. Herman's guy was Ellinger, and no yeah. matter how Bouchel played, there was going to be a transition that season. And I don't know if that's going to be inevitable with Steve Sarkeesian and Hudson Card hoping he, that he can develop the younger prospect rather than stick with the older one and just get one two years out of Thompson. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think this is Thompson's job. Um, you know, he's kind of waited his turn here. You know, he's been here for the program for a while. He sat behind Sam. He's learned a lot, you know, so he is the vet here. Um, you know, but if you hear all of like the sayings and everything from the previous coaching staff and like, you know, even Sam even made some statements. He said that, uh, you know, Casey is always ready to play. He's a great leader. And, you know, but, uh, you know, Sam said that, Hudson has all the arm talent, you know, and all the coaches from last year have also said that, you know, Hudson has all the arm talent, but, you know, Casey is, you know, tried and true right now, just, just from being in the room for so long. So, you know, he has like that, like that it factor right now. And I'm hoping that, you know, like Casey gets to start here, but it's going to be a very, very good, uh, you know, this battle here in the spring. The Rod Farva chiming in with a question for you guys. Other than winning, which, of course, uh, helps the recruiting process pretty mightily, what does Texas need to do to keep the elite players in the state? So Yeah, winning. <laughs> I don't know what else to say, Rod. It's got to be winning, man. You know, if Texas is winning, you know, guys are going to want to come back to Texas, you know, and actually play at Texas. But Texas still gets a, a ton of talent. You know, um, um, I saw like a poll that uh, basically said that, that there were five teams that have gotten like the most talent in in uh, college over like the past five or six years. And it was Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia and Texas. You know, they have the most ESPN, you know, top, you know, like top. What is it? 300 guys in their their teams. Right. And only one team has never been to a CFP playoff game, and that's Texas. So Texas is getting the talent. It's just a matter of them getting this talent here, you know, actually coaching them up to the position and to the places where they should be, and then just letting them go, man. It's it's winning. Texas got the facilities a couple of years ago. They really focused on renovating that during the Herman era. They're getting DKR, the was it the south end zone, finally yeah. finished, having more seats there. I mean, they've done all the – a lot of the off the field stuff that they can do to help recruiting, but it's just winning and players want to go to a college where they think they, they can be in a new year six bowl game or a college football playoff. And what 18 out of 21 playoff games have been won by Alabama, Clemson or Ohio state. So yeah. if you're one of the top recruits in the country, no matter where you're from, you know, you're guaranteed if you go to one of those three schools that in four years, you will play in the playoffs, not one, not two, maybe three. three or times. <laughs> so those three programs have a monopoly on the sport right now. And Oklahoma is kind of the fourth one. I know they haven't won a playoff game, but they've been in the playoffs, what, four times in seven yeah. seasons. And they've been yeah. year. Yeah. Winning, winning cures all. Cures and, all. and there is so much talent in Texas. Let's understand that we're not talking about trying to protect the state of New York or the state of Indiana in terms of, okay, we're Syracuse. Let's try to lock down the state. There's so much talent in that state that, and, and so many schools like all the schools that you just mentioned that, and, and, and you got to share the state 
to a certain extent with Texas A&M, who's a juggernaut in terms of potential right mm -hmm. now, uh, facilities, big game coach, the whole deal going there. Texas A&M's a sleeping giant, uh, maybe not so sleeping anymore, that it's unrealistic to think, okay, we're going to keep 90% of the top 10 to 20 players in the state. It, it's just, it's not going to happen. You, you want to get more than them than Texas A&M or certainly lock in many more than the Ohio States and the Alabamas and the other schools coming in there. But to, it's unreasonable to think that you're going to lock in any one school is going to, with, with that much talent, it's arguably the best talent in the country. With Florida, it is. Those are the top two states mm -hmm. that you're going to lock in nine of the top ten every year. This is yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, definitely. You know, so like those days used to happen back in the day. You know, so Mac Brown used to pull whoever he wanted, whenever he wanted. He would close the borders down. But, you know, that is just something that is not going to happen anymore, especially with, you know, Texas A&M going to the SEC that – that really opened up the uh, the uh, gates, you know, to, you know, to Texas. So, you know, um, I think the the day that Texas and M left, it, um, I think uh, Saban actually put an office down in Houston, so he knew what it was from then on. So, hey, it is fair game right now. This is not the days of Mac Brown where he could go and pick, you know, his top twenty five out of like the top fifty players. You know, it, it it's it's a whole different uh, you, you know game now. So, and I think another big loss that Texas had this off season that an average college football fan, even diehards wouldn't know, is they lost a recruiting director of Brian Carrington. Who oh, was, BC, man. Everyone, <laughs> everyone in Texas loves Brian Carrington. Oh, BC, he's man. Working with players. He's at USC now. Uh, he's, he's a great guy in general, and I thought he did a lot for the recruiting and the branding of the program over the past few years, which that's going to be a hole that has to be filled. But I, I think that, that – I think that – was the saddest uh, departure for most Texas fans this offseason was losing Carrington. Definitely, man. BC was a beast when it came down to, you know, like just getting guys here on campus. But, you know, so Brandon Harris is kind of doing his thing right now, though. You know, but BC will, will definitely be missed. Definitely be missed, man. Mm -hmm. Again, want to remind everyone that you can get a Texas uh, mask, face mask. Uh, just go to voiceofcollegefootball.com or whatever team you want. Basically, we've got uh, the, the major teams covered with about 35 uh, masks. So free mask there. Just uh, register for free at voiceofcollegefootball.com. You get 20% off your first purchase, and we throw you into an entry for a $25 gift card as well. Uh, the Rod Farva had also asked about the Texas A&M game. It's been a while since it's been played. I always enjoyed it, thought it was one of the top five to ten rivalries in the sport. Thanksgiving weekend, typically on a Friday. Does it matter now? Has it been lost for so long? that, Or, or is that still uh, something you guys would like to see? Man, I would love to see it. You know, I'm a grad. You know, I finish out. And, uh, oh, man, I'm kind of telling my age here. But, you know, I finished out in, like, 2005. So, you know, I would love to see the game go on. You know, I think, you know, just for the kids who are there now, they probably don't understand how big of a of a game that was. But, you know, for me, it was like the game. You know, you had Texas A&M, you had OU. You know, you always saved up to buy tickets for those games. So I would love to have it. That's almost like the Texas Bowl, basically, you know, and that would just kind of silence folks for like a whole year on who is the best team for the year. So it needs to happen. It does. I'm tired of these comment sections just debating about it over the year. Texas can say, well, we have the historical record, and then Texas A&M can always counter with, ever since we left the Big 12, we've been had the better record every single season except for 2018, yeah. uh, seeing more better record. So there's so much bickering, and you see it even in the fight songs. Both of the fight songs <laughs> mention each other. I think it's a top-five rivalry in college football. It's In terms of hatred, the most, the most hatred in rivalries in college football, Iron Bowl, uh, Holy War, Utah BYU has so much hatred. Yeah. Follow that one. And then uh, Texas, Texas A&M's right up there. And then the Egg Bowl. I think mm -hmm. those ones are the ones that, and Ohio State, Michigan. Those are the five rivalries in college football where I just feel like the fans completely hate the other school. And I would love to see a Texas, Texas A&M game. Uh, see, they're both programs that uh, they looked good last year. I think it would have been a fun game to see. And how many years in a row has it felt like that the Texas Bowl has had the opportunity to 
have that matchup. And then ESPN, like Kyle Bonagura has it every year as his uh, predicted Texas Bowl, and it never happens because I think the SEC allocates their bowl thing, and they, they don't want the to return. If it ever returns, I think the perfect uh, launch would be to do it at a, at a Cotton Bowl. I, I think a New Year's Six game, uh, a yeah. Cotton Bowl maybe, uh, assuming it doesn't happen at the college football playoff. I think the Cotton Bowl would be the great way to renew the rivalry, have a neutral site, have half a uh, burnt orange, half maroon. Uh, I would be at that game in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, man, I'd be there. <laughs> I will be there. Folks, uh, register at uh, voiceofcollegefootball.com uh, and check out our site right there. Get yourself a free mask, Texas or whatever team. I know we're looking forward. Everybody's excited about Sark, the new staff, the whole deal. But I'm always fascinated to get from the people that know better than I do because I try to cover everyone at the same time and I'm looking in from the outside. When when a situation goes bad or a coach is fired, uh, whether there was a turning point or whatever the situation and the components involved in the demise of that particular coach, I'm always fascinated to get the take of you know what happened, what really happened here, what were those elements that came into play that, uh, you know, made for that result. So Nick, I'm going to start with you just in regards to your, your thought process about the Tom Herman tenure at Texas, what happened? Was he evaluated and judged fairly and what was his undoing? I think, uh, you know, everything that happened with Tom Herman was he couldn't beat OU, you know, that was first off, um, you know, after that, uh, he lost pretty much every recruit that he had. He lost Ewers. He lost Faison Wilson here, you know, and I think that was like one of like the last nails in the coffin. And then the whole eye situation, you know, with Sam, you know, just at the OU game, standing by himself out there with the picture being taken. And I think at that point, man, it was just a wrap for him there. I don't think he could have done anything to save his job, you know, minus, you know, like actually winning the Big 12 and going to like a college football playoff game. So, you know, I, I think after the the uh, OU game, I think, it, it you know, like that was said and done for him. It's my opinion. I've said before that I don't think that the Tom Herman firing was necessarily performance based when you saw the players reactions on Twitter when that happened on January 2nd, because I think there, there were some more internal things. And also, as a lot of people know, that Texas is a program really controlled by its boosters, where if the boosters demand something happens, some of the more influential ones, the thing happens. And that's how Texas has operated for a long time. So if the money says that they want Tom Herman out, Texas will do whatever buyout they can to get him out and have someone new in. So I, I don't think it's a performance base because I forget when the vote of confidence came from Chris Del Conte. I, if I recall correctly, Texas didn't lose a game after that. I think their only two games after that vote of confidence were Kansas state, which they yeah. dominated yeah. and the Alamo bowl, which they dominated and they finished ranked again and they improved from 2019 when they went eight and five with the Alamo bowl win. So I, I don't think it was performance based, but Texas is going to have a whole new coaching staff this year, and we'll see how long it takes before the boosters turn on them. So, how well do Texas fans look back on Mac Brown, and how is he viewed? Because you know what the situation is there. You can go to any particular institution and see the the favored coach who won a national championship, take Urban Meyer at Florida, but because of the way it ended and what he did to, to maneuver himself into another job, it's not necessarily looked upon favorably. Uh, but how is, how is Mac Brown received uh, at Texas? Steve? Uh, I did not grow up a Texas Longhorns fan. So in the Mac Brown era, I, I, I attended college there. Uh, so I'm not really sure like how they felt about him in the era, but I can just tell you from someone who is more of a neutral observer's perspective is growing up. I always thought Mac Brown was just one of the premier coaches in college football. And I was surprised that Texas kind of forced him out, uh, in the early 2010s after the 2013 season, just for what one losing season, then going like eight and five or something rather than that run of success they had in the two thousands. And then Mac Brown goes to the booth and he comes back and he turns a North Carolina team that Larry Fedora kind of crashed into the ground. He turns that North Carolina team into a New Year's Six squad just a couple years later. 
So I have nothing but respect for Mac Brown. And I think he's done a lot of great things. He just seems like a great and pleasant person to be around when I've talked to some people before that have worked with him at ESPN or some people at Longhorn Network who knew him well when he was at Texas. And even when I went to his online press conferences for the Orange Bowl this year, I thought Mac Brown just handles it well. He has a lot of friends and colleagues in the coaching business, and he seems like a guy that you'd want to play for as a player just because of the love he has of the program and the community around him. Yeah, you know, so definitely, you know, it's like um, I was there, you know, when Mac was there, and, uh, and Mac was the perfect CEO for this program. You know, he he knew how to talk to the boosters. He knew how to talk to the parents. He knew how to talk to the players. Uh, to the AD. He was just the guy that was the glue for everything. You know, um, I have a bunch of friends who actually played for him and, you know, Mac never wrote down X's and O's, right? So he was just the guy that would come into the room every now and then and just check on you, see how, you know, that room is doing, you know, but he would never just call like a play. He had his coaches do that. He was the perfect CEO for the school, you know, so he is going to be forever loved at the school, you know, like just for, the, you know, just that one simple fact that he did win that Rose Bowl. You can find us at uh, PayPal, Venmo, and Cash App. Just search Mark Rogers TV to contribute uh, to the channel. Um, we've got um, Nick Battle online. You can catch him right here on YouTube. Just uh, put it right in the search bar. Nino's Corner right here on YouTube. Find his YouTube channel. He does exceptional work covering Texas football. We've got uh, Steve Helwick on the line from SB Nation, Underdog Dynasty, and also Hustle Belt. And uh, both of you attended and graduated from the University of Texas. I'll ask this question. Why did you choose Texas, Nick? All right. Funny story. So originally, man, I am from Shreveport, Louisiana. My mom married my stepdad. He was in the army, moved to Fort Hood, which is just like an hour down the street from Texas. You know, I finished high school. I'm trying to figure out, hey, where is school going to be for me? And then, you know, Texas came calling. And, uh, you know, I, I went to Texas. I enjoyed it. It was right down the street from the house, but I'm a big football fan too. And, you know, um, you know, I grew up watching James Brown play and, you know, just seeing like Priest Holmes and Ricky play. And so I was like, Hey man, Texas is good. And, uh, yeah, man, I just wanted just to go to Texas cause it was close to home and it, it is like the flagship school of the state. So, you know, to me, it was a no brainer. I'm from the Houston area, so Texas is in-state school. I applied to five schools, Texas, TCU, Texas A&M, as much as Texas fans are going to hate that, <laughs> uh, and then throughout the state, North Carolina, and then Penn State, which was always my dream school growing up. That's uh, where my parents went, and I grew up going to the whiteouts and going to games at Beaver Stadium there. But when it came time to apply for college, I didn't think the out-of-state tuition and all of that made sense. And then Texas offered a really good computational chemistry program, which was my original major. Later, I switched to actuarial sciences, but I enjoyed my four years there, uh, Texas. And that's how I got there and graduated from there. Very cool stuff. Talking Texas football for the first time on a full hour live stream here at the Voice of College Football. We got Steve Helwick on the line from SB Nation and also Nick Battle from Nino's Corner. You can join him right here on YouTube. And... Um, yeah, I think it's going to be fascinating to see what plays out here, certainly over the next three or four years. As you guys project toward this fall, um, what do you think is reasonable, Steve, in regards to what should be expected out of this team? I think this is a team that's going for a third place Big 12 finish. And it feels like I don't really see them in the Big 12 championship game. Iowa State has so much talent returning to the team. You still have Brock Purdy and Brees Hall there running the offense, and Mike Rose, their star outside linebacker on defense. I think Iowa State still has a lot of talent, but I don't think they're a shoe in for the Big 12 title game necessarily. But Oklahoma is. That's the annual Oklahoma Classic is the Big 12 title game that they have in Arlington. But then there's some other good teams. I like what I saw from what we're going to see, the future of Oklahoma State really in the Cheez-It Bowl. They had a lot of opt-outs and uh, guys that it played hurt, like Tylen Wallace and Chuba Hubbard may be gone from the program, but I think they have a lot of skill position players that can fill that void. And Mike Gundy never really has a down year. I can't remember the last time Oklahoma State finished with a losing record. So right. I think this is going to be really a three-team race for that. And you could even throw West Virginia there just because I think Neil Brown's uh, help grow that program pretty well. But I, I think it's going to be mainly Oklahoma versus 
Iowa State, Texas, or Oklahoma State for that second spot. So I think Texas could really expect eight and four, nine and three in the regular season and try to be in contention for that game. Yeah, definitely, man. So, you know, I'm thinking nine and three, maybe 10 and two. Texas just has too much talent. Um, if it all comes together here with the coaching, you know, Texas shouldn't lose no more than two games this year. Um, you know, you know, like this is Texas, <laughs> you know, we have all the talent. Finally, we got coaches here who are going to coach, you know, coaches here who have coached at big time schools, you know, um, um, coaches who have coached, you know, like basically like in the league, you know, so we have a, you know, um, a coach who came here from a championship pedigree, um, you know, didn't have a, 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 a actual head coaching job prior to here to where he had to bring his whole staff with him. Right. So he was able to go cherry pick guys that he wanted. So he didn't have to bring in the guys at Houston that helped him get this job, you know? So Steve, you know, Sark basically got the flood, you know, he got banks, you know, he got the Davis, he got Terry Joseph. I mean, he's, he's assembled a staff here that I think is going to be able to coach better than the previous staffs have. And I think Texas can finish around nine and three, 10 and two, and hopefully be paying, you know, like basically in that big 12 championship game this year. You said about the hires, I think quiet Kowski is my favorite of the hires. Oh, man. I see of what his defenses did at Washington. They had a top five defense, I think, two or three years running just uh, from 2016 through 18, back when they were in three straight New Year Six Bowls. It was really the defense that was always elevating that unit. And we we're talking about that. We want to see player development at Texas. Look at what they had at Washington. Look at all the defensive backs that were oh, drafted man. in the first yeah. two rounds while Kwiatkowski was at Washington. You have Marcus Peters. You have Sidney Jones. Yeah, you have Buda Baker. Mark Buda Baker. <laughs> And these, these guys are talented NFL players. They're all first and second round picks. So when you're seeing Texas, I know it looks a little better this year with Samuel Cosme and Joseph Hasai, but recently Texas has been kind of coming up empty handed or more empty handed than they should be on draft day. So I think that quiet Kowski could go a long way in just developing players at defense because he had monstrous defensive lines and a lot of good blankets secondary players in Washington. And that's something that I think Texas needs to look forward to under his reign as a defensive coordinator. Definitely, definitely. And especially like on the D-line also, he had one season. He had three guys that all got drafted. He had Qualls, he had Gaines, and he had Vita Vea. I mean, he gets those guys there, guys that, you know, some teams didn't even want, you know, and he brings them there. He cultivates them and he gets those guys to be draft picks. You know, so he is going to be a guy who's going to, actually coach these guys up and have these guys be to where they need to be. I'm with you on that, Steve. We're a long way from uh, National Signing Day in December. Right now, we've got six hard commits. We've got the second-ranked class in the Big 12. Again, it's very early, top 10 in the nation at number eight. Nick, um, any rumblings out there in regards to any particular possible commits coming uh, Texas's way in the near future? Any big targets you want to run down for us? My big target, the guy who I want Texas to get is Campbell, the big offensive guard out of Bowie, Texas. Uh, he's a he's a hell of a player. You know, he's a five star guy. Um, he's probably if you had a draft board, he would be like your number one guy. He's just a a, a straight freak of nature, six four, three hundred and twenty pound guy who can run like the wind blows. Also, just a nasty guy. So you know, I would love to have him. Um, who else, man? Coleman, you know, Coleman is a wide receiver and he's out of St. Louis, Missouri. Another good guy who actually wants to come and play with Murphy, who's our quarterback guy. Right. So, you know, if, if we can just start getting talent here, you know, that, you know, especially just on, on like the lines and things of that nature, I think Texas can get to exactly where it needs to be. How about you, Steve? Uh, I'm not sure about really uh, prospect commits, but of uh, the ones that they already have, I've been really impressed on the highlight tape of Jatavion Sanders, just because he's a guy who plays offense and defense, which is something that we saw. I think Steve Sarkeesian was at Washington, maybe at the same time as Will Disley, who played offense, defense at tight end and defense. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So I'm wondering how that could really be implemented to uh, Texas's team and see how he could go from there when he plays, because I think that's a fascinating dynamic that he has to offer. And his highlight reel is insane. If you oh, Sick. He has a bunch of one-handed catches, man. It's ridiculous. That's, that's a big boy, man. <laughs> 
I have uh, wanted to pull together a Texas live stream for a long time. So much appreciation here to uh, Nick Battle and to Steve Helwick. I want to let you guys uh, let people know where they can find you, whether that be on Twitter, social media, or here on YouTube. So you first up, Nick. Hey, everything is just Nino's Corner. It's just one word. Just go find it every Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the same word, Nino's Corner, right? Yeah, that's it. And I'm on Twitter at S underscore Helwick, or just type my name, Steve Helwick. I'm the only Steve Helwick out there. And uh, you'll find a lot of just general college football coverage. I, I follow all 130 teams tweeting about all of them on Saturdays and stuff. So any college football fans, you're welcome to join. I got to tell you guys that uh, people – marvel at me sometimes in regards to what i'm talking about how much uh, information stuffed into my head and then i get steve on here we talk about every school in the group of five and it's just and i know he's covering all the power five teams he can talk about all of them too I, and i can't even cover the group of five i bring in steve uh to to get a setup on the group of five as well and i just can't believe uh all the uh information that uh he's got locked up uh that he's ready to uh to, to discuss. So we appreciate Steve coming on here on a regular basis. And Nick uh, joined me for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and we had a great conversation and he's a wealth of uh, insight into Texas football. So we would uh, encourage you to head on over again to Nino's uh, corner right here on YouTube. Guys, I had a great time. Again, I've wanted to throw together a Texas live stream for uh, quite a long time. It was a great discussion. Would love to have you back. All right. Thanks, man. Anytime. Sounds good. Thanks for having us. We are coming right back to talk Notre Dame football at nine o'clock Eastern. So uh, keep it locked in right here. Just keep it on the channel and uh, we will be talking in Notre Dame at the top of the hour.